This will be Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to look at what the millennium and the great white throne judgment will be like. So Revelation 20 and verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So this angel is either extremely powerful or for this one moment, God is going to give him just enough strength to bind the devil. Is Satan really the most powerful or only the most powerful that went bad? Maybe there's angels that are more powerful. Powerful. Maybe Michael the archangel is more powerful. Who knows? Whoever this angel is, I imagine it will be an honor for him to bind the serpent. Obviously, it is a good angel that didn't leave its first estate. But he has a key to open the bottom of the spit. And this is because hell has gates. And Jesus talks about them in Matthew sixteen eighteen. Not only this, but he has a key. And he has a chain in his hand. And this is one sturdy chain. Because Satan is going to be in a tight leash for a thousand years. The Bible talks about chains that the fallen angels are bound with. If you look at verses like Jude in verse 6, it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And then Second Peter 2, 4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So God uses chains to bind angels. He's going to use a chain to bind the devil. And obviously, these are chains that are much stronger than any ordinary chain on the earth. Remember that the devil possessed man in the Gospels broke the chains and no man could bind him. So spirits have supernatural strength. So it's going to take some supernatural chains to bind them. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 2. It says, And he laid hold on the dragon. So the angel lays hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And this is a key verse in any study of Satan. Notice the names it gives for the devil, the dragon. This helps us link him to Leviathan. In Isaiah 27, 1, it says, In that day, and when the Bible says in that day, it's referring to the day of the Lord. In that day, the Lord with his sword and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Notice Leviathan is also called the piercing serpent, while Satan is called that old serpent. And this links him to Genesis 3 as the one who beguiled Eve through his subtlety. It refers to him as the devil. In the Bible, there are many devils, but one devil. And one of the main characters in the Bible is the devil. You can't teach the Bible very long without having to mention it. But the old serpent is bound 1,000 years. And this is how long the millennium will last. A literal 1,000 years with Jesus Christ reigning with Satan bound. So that's our first thing we're going to talk about is the serpent is bound for 1,000 years. Men will still have a sin nature but they can't use the excuse, the devil made me do it. And it also looks like unclean spirits will be tossed out of the land. So no temptation from the unclean spirits that the devil might influence to influence us. In Zechariah 13, 2, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Imagine a place with the serpent bound and no unclean spirits. Revelation 20 and verse 3. It says, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So he's going to have a long time to think about what he's done. And the angel sets a seal on him. And when God sets a seal, you can't break it. Only he can. And during this time, he won't deceive. So deception will be at an all-time low. 
But after the thousand years, he will be loosed. And you'll see why he's loose soon in this study. But number one in the millennium, you have the serpent bound. You're not going to have to deal with the devil during these 1,000 years. And number two, you have saints reigning. In Revelation 20 and verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sit upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So the millennium is going to be amazing if you are right with God. The curse will be lifted off the ground in the millennial age. And after the fall, the ground was cursed, and Adam then had to eat in sorrow. We have to sweat and do hard labor to get food and provide for our family now. In Genesis 3.17 it says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat, it, eat of it all the days of thy life. But see, the curse that came about in Genesis 3 is taken away in the millennium. People in this millennial age will not have to deal with what we had to deal with after the fall. Amos 9, 13 through 15 give a good description. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord God, thy God. Mechanical equipment probably isn't going to be used in the millennium. There won't be any of the modern day equipment we have today. It will all most likely be done by hand and animals. People are going to work with their hands and use the animals. In Isaiah thirty two, fifteen through twenty, it says, Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest, then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness quietness and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. When it shall hail, coming down in the forest, and the city shall be low in a low place. Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters, that send forth tither the feet of the ox and the ass. So there's going to be working with the animals, and people will be working with their hands, and it will be enjoyable. There will be millions of born-again believers walking around with supernatural glorified bodies that will be able to help build anything. Uh, imagine that many people running around with supernatural strength. They say in the days of Noah, they had all the uh, giants that built things that had supernatural strength. But born-again believers in their glorified bodies are going to have even more supernatural strength than that. And there will be no limit to what could be built. But there will be no couch potatoes in the millennium. And some people's fantasy world is laying around watching Netflix. But God didn't make men to desire abundance of idleness. He wants men to be busy and to enjoy their work. And this work becomes enjoyable again in the millennium. In Isaiah sixty-five twenty-one through 22 it says, And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And Paul talks about working with your own hands in the Pauline epistles. So there's something about working with their hands that God likes. He doesn't want us to just be sitting around doing nothing. Even the trees and the hills in the millennium will praise his name. In Isaiah fifty-five twelve 
through 13 it says, For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace, and the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So imagine the trees clapping their hands and the hills praising God. It seems like one of those fairy tale stories you heard as a kid that you thought weren't real. But stuff like this actually is real. And many times those fairy tales and movies are just copying the Bible. The devil loves to take the real things of God and turn them into fairy tales. Animal life will be completely different during this millennial time period. You won't be able to have a you will be able to have a pet leopard or, or a lion or a bear or a wolf and they won't even try to eat you. And the little child will lead them. Any movie that has a little kid befriending a wild animal is just stealing the idea from the Bible. Because that's what's gonna go on in the millennium. Some people believe that the animals can even talk during this time, and that is why you have movies that are so popular with the talking animals. What do they try to attract kids with in movies? A bunch of talking, animated animals. That's what will take place in the millennium, is you're going to have kids befriending a bunch of wild animals. Hollywood can't come up with an original thought. And then in Isaiah 11, 6 through 8, it says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Not the lion, the wolf. They say that Mandela effect changed it and it was supposed to be the lion. But it says the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice and the wolf. And the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. So the saints from the time of Jacob's trouble will reign with Jesus Christ. And this is their reward for dying as a martyr, by being beheaded or by enduring to the end of that time period without taking the mark of the beast or worshiping the beast. They get to live and reign with Jesus Christ. And notice the way of their death is beheading. People are being beheaded now, right now for the faith, and the Bible gets it right every time. And Revelation 20 and verse 5, Revelation 20 and verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Notice it talks about a second death. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. That is the physical death, but there is also a second death. And that is where when, se when death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. That's the second death. In Revelation 20 and verse 14 it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. But there are going to be saints reigning in the millennium, but church saints also reign. In 2 Timothy 2.12, it says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. The better life you live on earth right now, the more reign you will get. But Revelation 20 and verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And you take part in the first resurrection. There's three parts of the first resurrection. You have the first resurrection when Jesus resurrected and he took some of the Old Testament saints up with him. You have the church age saints going out in a rapture. And then you have the tribulation saints that also take part in the first resurrection. The second resurrection, you don't want to take a part of that second resurrection. That's when the dead, death and hell come up, and then they're cast into the lake of fire. You want to be a part of that first resurrection. 
And if you want to be a part of that, then you need to get born again. But so far we have the Serpent Bound. We have Saints Reigning. And number three, we have Satan Loosed. Revelation 20 and verse 7 says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. You know in all the movies, the bad guy always comes back to terrorize his victims one more time. And that is what happens here. And this shows that outside of the Bible, there is no original plot and no new thing under the sun. Revelation 20 and verse 8 says, And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, and the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So he deceives nations. And who are the people being deceived? There are people who went into the millennium with natural bodies who continued having children. And these children would grow up in a Garden of Eden-like atmosphere and they will live longer. In Isaiah 65, 20, it says, There shall no more thence an in there shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. Methuselah lived to be 969 back in Genesis. So it is possible that even some who are born at the beginning of the millennium, millennium will be alive in their natural body at the end of the millennium. It's possible. Imagine how many babies this will produce. People keep being born and keep having children. And with the lack of crime and murder, the lack of animals attacking people, imagine how long they will, these people will be around. These are the people who will be able to be deceived by the devil and join his satanic army. Uh, the Bible talks about enemies of the Lord being around during the millennial reign who will will not bow down to Jesus Christ, even though um, they they will bow down to Jesus Christ, even though they don't want to. Inside, they're not bowing down, but on the outside, they're bowing down just so they don't, you know, reap the consequences. Psalm 72, 8 through 9 says, He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow down, shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. So there's going to be enemies of God during the 1,000 years. Psalms 110 and verse 2 says, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So there are plenty of people who aren't converted, but make it into the millennium as Christ rejectors. Zechariah 14, 16 through 19 says, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So there's going to be enemies that come to worship or pretend to worship. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So if they don't, then their stuff isn't going to grow. They're not going to get any rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So that's going to go on. If they don't come, they're going to get plagued. And this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So there you have the heathen in the millennium whose children will most likely go against Jesus Christ and form this army, this satanic army that's as many as the sand of the sea. In Daniel eleven forty one through 42, it talks about people who escape the Antichrist's hand so there can be men like the doomsday preppers who somehow escape from taking the mark and don't get beheaded, yet they aren't saved. And they'll be the enemies of God. Just like today, there are people who are aware of the wickedness of the world and they're against the wickedness of the world, yet they aren't even professing Christians or aren't Bible believers. Maybe they say that they're saved, but they don't believe the Bible. They don't care about the things of God. But yet they're not deceived by 
a lot of the wickedness going on, and there'll be people like that. Matthew 25 talks about people who come through into the millennium that helped the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble, and they may or may not be saved. But this army is as many as the sand of the sea, and it will be made up of, of, some, of some of those people as well. This is going to be an incredible amount of people. But look what happens in Revelation 20 and verse 9. It says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. God is so powerful, and Satan and his army are so weak that the battle only gets one verse. Uh, God just uses his flamethrower and devours them with it. And many times people ask if God is so powerful then why doesn't he just kill all the bad people and the devil and be done with it? They they don't like how he operates. They want God to just come down and just kill every bad thing at one time, but God doesn't operate like that. God could easily just kill the devil right now if he wanted to, but he isn't. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. But in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9, God does what people have been desiring him to do. He just gives it a quick ending. There is no long drawn out battle. It is just over. And God shows his power so much that the satanic army only gets one verse. And it says, fire come down from God out of heaven and devour them. And that's it. Nobody even has to lift a finger. And then Revelation 20 and verse 10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Notice it says where the beast and the false prophet are. Jesus Christ had put them in there a thousand years prior to this, and they are still there. This shows that hell is eternal. You don't just burn up and get out. You continue to burn. They are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire right now as we speak. And Satan will be tormented day and night forever and ever. He never gets out. And this time it is for good. He's not going to be loosed again. God beat the devil up all the way through the Bible, and finally it's over. If you have read the Bible, you will see how God played with the devil like a cat plays with a mouse and used him and wiped the floor with him. The devil was never winning, and he never had a chance. So we have the serpent bound, saints reigning, Satan loosed, and last we see sinners judged. In Revelation 20 and verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, and from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So who is on this great white throne? In Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were opened. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. That's the saints. And then ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. That's the people that's going to be judged. Notice this is what is referred to as the great white throne judgment, which is different from the judgment seat of Christ where... We will be judged, the born-again believer. The common belief is that all the saved people are judged at the judgment seat of Christ and that only lost people are judged at the great white throne judgment. But one question, if that's true, where are the millennial saints judged? Where are the tribulation saints judged? If the judgment seat of Christ was already passed, they have to be judged somewhere, and that's here at the great white throne. And some people think that's false doctrine, but they had to be judged somewhere. And all we're doing is putting the events in order. And if the judgment seat of Christ is passed, and the millennial saints and tribulation saints haven't been judged, then where do they get judged? Just because you never heard something before doesn't mean it isn't true. Revelation 20 verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So the earth and heaven have fled away. So this possibly means God has destroyed heaven and earth before he makes the new heaven and a new earth. Some believe the earth doesn't get completely destroyed and that it's just regenerated. But that's what I believe happened when the millennium started. I believe 
he he re regenerated the earth, re renovated the earth. But it seems here it gets completely destroyed and God's gonna make a new one. Some disagree and I've went back and forth with it trying to figure it out. But it seems to me it it gets completely destroyed. But if you don't if you disagree with that then it's no big deal really. Revelation 21 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And Second Peter 3 10 talks about this. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are, there, uh, that are therein shall be burned up. And this seems to be referring to the destruction of the heavens and the earth. You say, well, that is the second advent because it says the day of the Lord. Yeah, but the day of the Lord covers more than just the second coming. The day of the Lord covers the millennium. It covers over a, a, a thousand years. Read a few verses previous. It says in Second Peter 3, 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So the day of the Lord in Second Peter three eight isn't just talking about, and Second Peter three ten isn't just talking about the second coming. So Revelation twenty and verse eleven says, "And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them." And then in Job thirty four twenty two it says. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. No man's hiding at the great white throne judgment. Proverbs 28 through 9 says, A king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil with his eyes. Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? No one's going to be able to say that they don't deserve hell. And it seems these sinners being judged aren't going to even have a place to stand. In Psalms 1, 5, it says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They're going to be floating up there in nothing but the filthy rags of their own wicked righteousness. That's no good. That's filthy rags. Revelation 20 and verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The books which are opened is most likely the Bible, which contains 66 books. And we will be judged by the word of God that mentions every sin we could possibly commit. John twelve forty eight says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. What's going to judge him? The Bible. The King James Bible. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So now the book of life is open for a reason. If there isn't anyone being judged whose name is in the book of life, then why does God open it? Why is the book of life there if there's not any righteous man at this judgment? So there are some safe people being judged here and they are in the book of life. Old Testament saints are probably judged here as well. Revelation eleven seventeen through 18 says saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast ranged, reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, in the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. It looks like this is talking about the great white throne judgment, and it's saying... And that thou shouldest give a reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints. There's going to be some safe people there. These people are going to be standing before God, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The ones being judged at the great white throne are the unsaved from Adam and Eve to the rapture of the church, and the saved and the unsaved from the time of Jacob's trouble 
in the millennium. The only people that aren't judged here is the saved people from the church age, the born-again believers. Angels also get judged here as well. In 1 Corinthians 6, 3, it says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? The fallen angels are judged by the saints. In Jude 6, it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And then Revelation twenty thirteen and fourteen fifteen it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Once again showing that there are some people there whose names are in the book of life. Don't just reject something because you never heard it or because you never thought of it, but be open to change your view if the Bible shows you something different. You don't have to take your favorite preacher, his view on everything, on every topic. If the Bible teaches something different, then just go with what the Bible says. But this has been Revelation chapter 20.